privatization. I got it, yes. And how to counter it, or maybe how to counter it. And for this debate, we've invited uh, Dieter Plewe and Miriam Katzin. And I'll introduce you a bit more in just a few minutes. But before we move on, my colleague Slatko Jovanovic will explain a bit about how we do the meetings on Zoom. So Slatko, the microphone is yours. All right, thank you. Thank you, Rasmus. And I have now taken the sound of of you, of all of you, in order to avoid any background noise. That means that uh, while speaking, uh, Dieter and Miriam, uh, you will be the only one speaking. Uh, and this doesn't mean that uh, the other ones will not be able to uh, to, to ask any questions or to, to talk to, to the other ones. Uh, that will be, it will be possible to, to ask your questions later. Uh, if you have a question uh, during or after the presentation, uh, uh, go to chat at the bottom bar, uh, find the chat approximately in the middle and uh, click on the chat icon and write your question to me, to Zlatko Jovanovic. You can also just write that you have a question on. And then I will, I will collect the questions during the presentations and uh, then I'll give you after that the, the, the opportunity to pose the question yourself. In case that you don't have a, don't have a mic, uh, you can also write your question and let me know, I can, I can read it for you. Uh, so that's uh, that's a good thing uh, that several of us have cameras on. That's always the nice nicest way to debate when we can see each other uh, with cameras on. And uh, one of the things also in terms of seeing each other, uh, and that is important to mention here, if you haven't tried before with the, with the Zoom, if you uh, move your uh, mouse on your, on your computer, uh, on your screen, and the top right uh, corner, you have an option called view. In that option, you can choose either speaker or gallery view. Speaker meaning to see only the person who's speaking at the moment and gallery view meaning seeing all of the participants or most of the participants. Uh, so uh, if you are using iPad, in case you're using iPad, that this option will be on your left side. There are like nine dots you can click on and then choose this. And finally, I want to inform you that this uh, meeting will be recorded uh, for the purpose of uh, the is documenting. It will be also possible to see it on the YouTube later. That's all from me and welcome again. Thank you, Slatko. My name is Rasmus Nalem Sørensen, and I'm the Chief Analyst and uh, General Secretary of the Democracy in Europe organization. And for the past few years, we've been working with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Brussels um, on a series of workshops, conferences, and this year, online workshops on the future of democracy. And in this series of debates, six in all, and this is the fifth debate, we've been looking into sort of the post-corona crisis. Now it's more or less in the middle of the corona crisis, and um, it's, it's an open question whether there is an economic crisis to it in, in Germany, in Sweden at least. Um, but what we try to get a, a grasp on is, is whether we can democratize uh, the economy, um, gain democratic control over part of the economy, and where these uh, crisis solutions we see with the investment packages and so on, and a new appetite for, for investing public funds in, in the welfare state, but also in society in general, what does that leave the left? What kind of opportunities does that create? So um, to get a hold of the debate today on privatization and neoliberal politics, we have invited Dieter Pliebe, and he's a lecturer at the University of Kassel. And you have been writing extensively on, on different uh, sort of uh, subjects concerning neoliberalism. And in your latest um, publication uh, called The Changing Politics and Policy of Austerity from this year, you've edited a book on that. And I hope you can give us sort of a, an idea about uh, what is happening in, in the field you have been studied. And I'll leave the microphone to you first. And after that, to your colleague from Sweden, Miriam Katzing. So welcome to Dieter, please. 
Thanks a lot for offering this opportunity to share some of the work and the thoughts um, around the really important questions we're dealing with. Let me share my screen um, so that I can show you some of the some of the slides um, I've prepared for this. Um, yeah, how to deal with the with some of the most significant social and political questions of our age in eight minutes uh, that we are given to talk here. We better do not waste time asking the key questions, I say. Is this indeed the time to move that we will move beyond privatization and commercialization of critical services from care to public health to transportation, education, and so on in light of the multiple crisis uh, of the COVID pandemic and catastrophic warming? Or do we have to brace ourselves yet for another return of austerity and growing pressure on public finance leading to another round of privatization and cutbacks in such essential services, like it happened in the aftermath of the global financial crisis and the Euro crisis back in 2008. The pandemic led to increasing levels of government action and spending, the return of the state, as many say, which led observers to emphasize the fundamental if crisis, if not the end of neoliberalism again. It is unclear, however, uh, if we need to talk about yet another crisis within the neoliberal era, or if we can indeed speak about the beginning of some post-neoliberal time. I have uh, co-edited a number of books on neoliberalism um, in which we have repeatedly warned against um, superficial observations, somewhat of superficial observations pertaining to the demise of neoliberalism. A common misunderstanding of neoliberalism thinks of this ideology as market radicalism and rigid anti-state philosophy, which ignores the extent to which neoliberalism relies on government and government interventions just with its own set of objectives. So it's basically sometimes the danger to fall victim to the neoliberal rhetoric, to sort of like ideological rhetoric rather than um, a critical analytical perspective of neoliberal politics um, that needs to be uh, done. First speculations about the end of neoliberalism um, have been voiced, in fact, at the end of the Thatcher and Reagan and the Cole government years. Um, back then, new labor governments across Europe uh, declared their opposition to neoliberalism, identified basically with these conservative governments, but ushered in unprecedented neoliberal welfare reforms, as we know. Expanding cheap service sector labor markets, even in highly regulated countries, uh, and creating the growing army of working poor and marginalized working, class, working classes, frequently with a large share of female and ethnic minority workers, even in highly uh, densely uh, trade unionized countries like Sweden um, or Germany, for, as a matter of fact. Um, Secondly, the brief period of international monetary cooperation and fiscal expansion, the return of Keynesianism after the global financial crisis for the brief period of two years, led many again to announce the death of neoliberalism only to return with the harshest austerity measures we have seen in countries hit hardest by the crisis not of their own making uh, in southern Europe, for example. Thirdly, COVID and the climate crisis have clarified beyond doubt the many shortcomings of downrun public services and commercialized and privatized public health and care sectors. The extraordinary crisis measures taken to fight the pandemic are once again seen to provide the evidence, not only for the limits of the neoliberal order, but for its imminent demise. Yet can we be sure only because the increasing clarity with which we observe the capitalist irrationality and irresponsibility of the neoliberal order, both domestic, European, and globally, it does not have to become subject to terminal contestation. Neoliberals, in fact, try 
even in the present time, to use the of COVID crisis and the climate crisis to advocate the removal of restrictions on technology and regulations in the name of innovation and risk taking, for example. We also see an expansion of think tanks and other capacities of neoliberal forces um, around the world, like the Atlas Economic Research network, um, which grew after the global financial crisis from 200 think tanks to almost 500. Um, so we need to look at the sort of like forces, the activities that are going on there. Um, it will take still a while, I'm arguing, that we can assess indeed if we um, can speak about a turn against neoliberal ideas of this time, or if we will again return to the neoliberal normal, no matter if democratic or more authoritarian. Saying this, I do not want to naturalize uh, neoliberal dominance, if not hegemony, nor do I want to ignore contradictions and openings for alternatives at evidence in some of the present political struggles and battles in Europe and beyond. Instead of speculating about it, we should focus, however, on key struggles and contestations of the neoliberal past and present that seem to not go away quickly. We need to develop a keen sense of direction from these observations in the effort to indeed overcome uh, neoliberal varieties of capitalism. And one of the key struggles, of course, of, um, um, of neoliberals against social democrats, socialists, and so on, um, and social liberals, and then later nowadays of the trade unions and the social movements against neoliberalism, was around privatization, of course. A central objective of the welfare state developed after World War II can be described as decommodification of certain areas, the removal of certain areas of life from the principles of the market and profit making. Far short of socialism, mind you, um, this welfare these welfare regimes expanded the range of public services in which private enterprise activities were limited, tightly regulated, or excluded and public health and care, transportation, education, and other infrastructure services then became the kind of dominant aspects of the mixed economies we had at the time and that were rolled back, the kind of non-commercial uh, areas of the economy were rolled back in, neoliberal, in the neoliberal era. Neoliberalism is a program of commodification and marketization and profit making, of course, but for which the government control, a lot of government control is needed and required. Um, I'm just sort of like offering a few glimpses of sort of like dimensions of the privatization uh, developments where we can see this is all stock taking in OECD material where we can see that uh, all over the OECD and other countries, uh, there was a huge increase um, in privatization. And of course, these figures relate to a number of different uh, sectors. So they're basically across the board. Um, and we see also it's not necessarily steady. Sometimes the, uh, the figures go down and then maybe up again. And uh, so basically it's only clear that um, again, sort of like the notion of uh, taking away from the private sector segments of economic activities, there was a huge increase of opening of space of private, uh, of public space for private sector activities. This is really relevant because um, this graph, very hard to see, uh, shows that 10 to uh, up to 15 uh, percent of the activities of, um, of, of GDP is made up of government, uh, uh, the use of public uh, services or the purchase of public services. So it's a huge part of the GDP that is basically um, um, works around uh, public services and basically all the purchased parts uh, is in fact then the public sector buying from private sector additional services. So of course, this is a major part of economic activities that can either be uh, kept in, in, public, in the public realm or can also be moved towards uh, commercialized services. Um, we see that of course the countries 
you might have considered that the UK is very strong, but also France and Sweden. And actually in this graph, uh, it was Germany a little bit lower, but this refers to a relatively late 2006 to 2016 period of uh, privatization where the countries where you have most cases of such things. And in fact, um, it is very important to realize that when Thatcher started to privatize, she used, she used Germany as an example because Germany had already privatized a lot in the 1950s, 60s. Um, important to the service sector, the, the, the care sector was the 1995 welfare reform in Germany, which introduced a new area of the welfare state, the old age care um, insurance scheme. But it removed at the same time the non-profit privilege the companies uh, were facing in the care and health service sector. So basically the coal government at the time added a new layer to the welfare state, but at the same time transformed the welfare state into uh, sort of like an opening for commercial activities and thereby created the ambiguity of, you know, of companies, corporations in the service sector. Do they look at the bottom line mainly profitability of the corporation or do they look at uh, the, the best development of care? And I think it's important to emphasize that not necessarily the economizing in the, in the healthcare and the public, um, in the elderly care is the trouble because it's actually not unreasonable to think about economic ways to do things, but it's the question if it's for profit because that turns uh, another principle of, of, of. So basically, the, the um, um, I think we will hear more uh, about the Swedish case in this regard. Now, of course, what happened in the last years um, is actually an interesting movement against many of these privatized outsourcing public-private partnership services. And we have one nice study from the TNI um, in, um, in the Netherlands on the battles over remunicipalizations of public services. And I thought this was highly interesting um, that um, Germany of all countries seems to have a very large number of such contestations. And of course, in Berlin with the, um, with the effort to socialize the big real estate companies um, and so on, it's a good uh, case. Um, and of course, many of these uh, instances that were collected in this survey um, publication relate to the energy sector where a lot of uh, public utilities, local public utilities, utilities were basically taken back um, in public control in order to advance the, um, the renewable energy share. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but also apart from uh, these areas, there's also cleaning services um, and other uh, previously outsourced and privatized um, elements of public services. That Peter, uh, as, are, a, as, a, as a final comment in your, your introduction here, um, could you could you tell us what what kind of a reason do you see behind this movement towards remunicipalization of, of services? Is that a federal Vorbundstag decision or is it uh, no is no it region it's or cities? Or, it's basically, um, I mean, it's really one of the clear examples where I see that um, neoliberalism is contested in a strong way. I mean, we see on the one hand, the dimension of previous privatization, and we see the beginning, or not only just the beginning now, of a kind of a strong bottom-up movement in many places against um, these privatizations. And um, actually, this is a little bit promising in terms of indeed moving against neoliberalism, because uh, in this process, like in the also the hospital sector struggles we recently had here in Berlin, we see also a, a very strong reunionization of the workforces um, that are so, sort of like struggling there. 2,000 new um, union members in the Verdi Union just in the last uh, round of strikes in the Berlin hospital sector. And so this is exactly the kind of um, conflict situation we see that we have the beginning of a, a stronger movement uh, for taking back some of the public sector control in these areas that have been privatized, which of course also opens up stronger uh, say for 
the organized workers for the workforces in these companies and the public direction, mm. sort of like controlled by the so, local. So there's uh, sort of a new direction in Germany and in, in some countries in, in Europe. Yes, I mean, we can see that the stock taking shows it's not, it's uneven across the countries. Mm. Uh, so there's a lot of room also. So the end of neoliberalism would probably require us to see many, many more of these battles. But at least on the other hand, we see these kind of um, mobilizations that, of course, then might also be connected um, across the different issue areas where they they uh, come up across the countries and um, then also basically across the scales of government because much of the activity is here local rather than uh, national. And so mm -hmm. there's a need, of course, to connect the, the spheres. Sorry for yeah. taking a little bit too long. The little no, bit of no, material. it's quite all right. But, but, uh, but thank you for, for the introductory remarks. And we'll move on to, uh, to Miriam Katzin. And you have done a thesis called Taking Care of Business because that's what your study sort of illustrates that, that this is one of the, the main purposes of government intervention in, in the services area, taking care of business rather than service uh, pro provisions. So, so Miriam catching uh, the movement towards taking back on democratic control or re municipalization isn't as strong in Sweden as we heard about in, in Germany. So, so what, what does your study show what, what's your opinion on this mm. uh, yeah let me first uh, start by thanking Dita and I think uh, my argument really relates to your argument uh, about how neoliberalism re um, relies on government and uh, I really appreciated your point of uh, not falling back into uh, anti-neoliberal uh, rhetoric, but rather have a critical analysis of the empirical cases. And that is what I've tried to do in my study. So um, my presentation will focus on um, the pre and post corona debates around welfare in Sweden, basically. Uh, let me share. So um, elder care is uh, the focus of my study. That's the case, home care services for, for elderly. And I think uh, during the pandemic, the elder care services of, in Sweden were um, on the international agenda because uh, of the high death tolls in, in Swedish elder care. Uh, unfortunately, my study was done just prior to the pandemic. So I cannot really relate uh, di direct, uh, directly to uh, what happened in the elder care during the pandemic. But um, I think there are uh, a lot of uh, general points to be made where Sweden is an interesting case, uh, where Sweden has uh, for decades been known as uh, a robust welfare state um, with a very ambitious uh, welfare services for, uh, for pr people. Um, Especially, I think, in the care sector, in the elder care sector, uh, it's an ambitious uh, and high quality service for all, uh, which is internationally unique. At the same time, and, and here is where I think uh, Dieter's point really uh, goes a long way, there is also um, a large uh, bulk of this sector is now privatized. And I think, and that is uh, uh, the reform that has created that situation is uh, the reform I um, study in my uh, uh, dissertation from last year. And also I will send you the link. So if you want to read it, it's online. Uh, so uh, one of the arguments that I make in my uh, thesis is that uh, Swedish neoliberalism is not an example of what, uh, uh, David Harvey has called it the circumscribed neoliberalism, meaning neoliberalism that hasn't gone as far. I would rather argue that uh, it's it's not that it hasn't gone as far, it has just taken another route. And this route is not deregulation, it's not uh, privatization of uh, responsibility or financing, but it's reconfigured and it's, an, it's a different balance uh, between the public and the private sector. Um, and I mean, uh, so the Swedish welfare state is built on Swedish social democracy. 
and and that project was uh, all the time uh, built on a compromise between state and capital and this is just a new configuration of that uh, balance is my um, main theoretical argument you could say but um i think uh if you look at what actually happened you could see that it's an introduction of public private partnerships and quasi markets uh, where the state or uh, the municipalities uh, are very active in creating uh, these uh, quasi markets and creating and supporting market actors. So what I empirically show in my study is that the municipalities uh, that I study that have introduced care choice system, meaning invited private uh, companies that are tax paid uh, but deliver the uh, the service to older people in need of assistance. Uh, the municipalities are very active in supporting. Uh, so there's a lot of funding going into not only uh, financing the service, but also supporting and controlling uh, the private actors within the sector. Uh, so uh, what we can see is that it hasn't, th there's no less affair here. It, it hasn't moved back into the homes. I mean, that has happened, but it, that's only a part of the story. It's, it's much more that the delivery of services are now, um, it, uh, services are now delivered by private, private actors. And um, uh, since there's also no cap on profit, uh, it's a large market for venture capitalists, the Swedish care market. Yeah, as I said, there are a few regulations of profit in the welfare sector. And uh, I mean, this is a long trajectory that just as Dieter uh, described started in the 90s, but it took a, a large step forward uh, during the uh, right wing Reinfeldt government of 2006 to 2014, uh, where also this, um, it, it's a, it, it was a search of privatizations, that I think changed the nature of the Swedish welfare state in a, in a way that has not really been internationally recognized uh, to the extent that uh, it, it actually should have, um, considering uh, to the de degree uh, in which it changed. Um, but uh, this, this came with a, a large reaction. Um, and in the election of 2014, the Swedish left party uh, that was their main issue to uh, have a, a debate um, uh, to, to um, uh, set a cap uh, to regulate the welfare sector. Um, and, um, uh, and it was also a very strong uh, opinion, public opinion uh, towards this. Uh, on the other can, side- can I, can I ask you, because in Denmark, uh, it's not uh, legal to take out a profit on children institutions, for example, and and maybe other service pro provisions. Is it? Yeah. Can you do that in Sweden? Can you yes. build a kindergarten and then earn a profit from, and and get public funding for it as well? Childcare, schools, elder care. Uh, there is a very limited regulation uh, in welfare overall, and I think uh, that's that that is what makes Sweden extreme. Mm. And um, is, is, is that the same in, in Germany, Dieter? Can you say you have profit from, from institutions there? You need to unmute. We, we can't hear you. Yeah. Now um, yeah, I mean, there's no, I mean, basically, there's no such restriction. I mean, I think that's interesting if there's um, countries uh, that have specific rules on profitability from uh, these sectors, which is at least one way to address this. But in, in Germany, the removal of the not-for-profit privilege in these sectors uh, has basically opened them up to simply to the normal rules that, uh, that count for all companies. Mm. Thank you. Mm. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Miriam. Uh, no worries. Your presentation. No, so what happened was that the uh, very well-organized Swedish business community 
uh, lobbied very strongly against this. And since the public, uh, even though the public opinion was largely in favor of uh, such a regulation, um, the government lost because it was a minority government. Uh, they lost uh, uh, when they tried to regulate it. And uh, then the debate has uh, uh, has really um, been hard to fight. But maybe uh, the Corona crisis has opened a new uh, frontier here. And uh, one of the things that has happened, and I guess has happened globally, is that uh, uh, care workers uh, and their um, conditions have been at the center in a whole new way. And in Sweden, um, the for a while, the conditions of the elder care, which had been a scandal since forever, uh, were finally making headlines. Um, and people were in a whole new way, uh, becoming aware of the, of the status of, of the elder care and the conditions that people are working in. So one of the things that has happened as a direct effect of this is that um, national regulation and funding um, has moved forward pretty quickly. And one of the things that are being funded is a prof professionalization of elder care. So now many more will uh, be educated within the sector. However, it's uh, municipally regulated uh, to a large degree, municipally financed. And that is one of the difficulties. So decentralization has also been a, a large issue on the agenda. And I think decentralization has happened for several reasons within Sweden. So lo local government has always been strong. There's always been a, a strive towards decentralization, which has also been a, a question of democratization. But it has, on the other hand, go, uh, gone hand in hand with a new public management agenda. And um, a, the, decent, the strong decentralization has also been um, a condition for uh, this privatization of delivery. Now it's just taken one step further and, and control is given uh, from municipalities to private actors. It's really, really difficult for central government to, uh, to govern what happens uh, on the floor in the elder care sector. Uh, so this is also much more debated now. Um, uh, another question which has been on the agenda is whether or not uh, the profit-driven uh, care institutions have had higher death tolls. Um, and uh, when looking at the nursing homes, um, there are things that point uh, in both directions, both that there is no difference and that there might be a difference. Um, and one uh, interesting point that is being made is that in municip municipalities with high privatization, death toll uh, amongst elderly overall has been higher. I mean, that's very tragic, but it's, it, it's not still not really um, empirically uh, looked into whether, why it's like that, um, but it, it's, when you have looked into, when you have studied this sector, it's pretty easy to understand how uh, a lot of um, not so serious actors uh, that are very difficult for uh, municipalities to govern uh, ca cannot have been the best care, care services uh, for the elderly during the, the pandemic. But uh, it, it's a very, it's, uh, it would be very interesting to, to look closer into it. Uh, but but that is also a debate that is taking place and uh, that uh, I, I hope will uh, push uh, the agenda here. Mm -hmm. And uh, another parallel debate that does not really um, relate to the pandemic, but is also happening now, is about the, uh, uh, the difficulty to get rid of uh, fraudulent and even criminal uh, actors within the sector. So there's a, a, a new book, which is also, um, I hope, will uh, get even more attention than it has, called The Home Care Mafia, that uh, discusses how much uh, um, the municipalities fight uh, pure criminal elements within the home care sector. Uh, so that, there are things, 
it's really, um, when it comes to the welfare sector, uh, there are really things move on the move right now. But it's, I think also it's very important for um, uh, the, the left party and uh, the left movement not to lose its grip uh, on this particular situation. And especially when it comes to the conditions for care workers and, and the status basically of, uh, of these welfare services. Thank you, Miriam. I think that'll be all uh, for, for now, but we open for the questions. And while you line up your questions, I would like you, Miriam, and maybe you, Dita, to comment a bit on, on, on your distinctions, Miriam, between the privatization of profits on the one hand, but also of maybe responsibilities. And then, as you mentioned it, on deliveries. So, so what's the distinction between these different kinds of, of, of uh, privatizations? Could you, could you explain that? Yes, so if I take the elder care as an example, uh, we have seen a, a, a moving back of uh, the public responsibility uh, in the sense that uh, the public now pays for, uh, for less services, basically. Mm. So, uh, uh, relatives, mostly, of course, uh, women, uh, have to take a, on a larger responsibility for older people in their, uh, in their family. Uh, things that uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago uh, was, were included in, uh, in the el public elder care are not anymore. So that is uh, privatization of responsibility. But it hasn't gone as far as in many other countries, and uh, and it started from a very high, a very ambitious uh, uh, um, organization of elder care, where uh, the the ambition in the eighties was that relatives would not have to care for their uh, their elders at all. So we are still at a high level of public responsibility, however, and and therefore also public financing. Um, you don't pay much for elder care in Sweden, regardless of if you're a high income earner or low income earner. Uh, it, it, it should be high quality services for all. However, the delivery, the uh, who actually comes to your home, they, they are nowadays much more often wearing a badge from a private company who in the end will be paid by tax money. What, what's the big picture regarding this data in, in Germany? Is, is, is that the same process you see? I mean, I'm um, not an expert in the care market. I only observed that um, in the recent sort of like uh, reporting um, that the share of the private companies in the sector are now um, pretty high. They're not quite as high than in some other countries, but I think four out of 10 um, are now private. Um, so that also means that, of course, the not-for-profit uh, organizations that were active exclusively before 1995, they're still basically the, the stronger, they have the stronger share of the market. But of course, they are now under the pressure of these uh, private companies on the one hand. And um, on the other hand, the, um, the workforces in Germany is a bit complicated in the not-for-profit sector that is in the sector. You have many religious organizations, which uh, are also sort of like undermining the, the uh, trade union collective bargaining contracts. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the whole situation is, is sort of like uh, complicated from a perspective of the, of the workforces in there. Mm -hmm. In terms of the coverage, um, I mean, on the one hand, as I mentioned, you have basically an increase of the welfare state in the 1990s, which many people don't think, but it is indeed an increase on neoliberal terms. So we are speaking not about simply removing the welfare state, but we're speaking about the transformation of the welfare state state to conform to neoliberal ideas and principles, which means commercialized ideas, insurance ideas, um, which means competition in the in the delivery of services and so on and so forth. And Germany, of course, uh, was a bit more neoliberal from the beginning under Erhard. We have a public and private public health system. So the competition has been introduced early on and simply has been reinforced. But that means that the whole constellation is, is um, 
um, opening up exactly these questions of how in the future should we want public services and the, the pandemic has clarified that the present system is definitely um, under capacity, understaffed, underpaid. And so the struggles that we are now seeing uh, that revolve against sort of like um, in, in a kind of a new resolve um, about uh, increasing the standards both for the employees in the system and be, and for the sort of like services. That's very interesting because that sort of like brings in uh, responsible objectives and social objectives where before you had basically the only argument about cost and competition. And uh, I think that's the opening in the debate that we're not any longer just discussing the the, um, the cost aspect and the competition competitiveness, the, the the direct cost for the users and the indirect costs for the businesses, uh, but also basically what's actually the objective um, in public health and and care services. And uh, if we move this discussion, I think um, there's a good chance to to make good political arguments uh, with the programmatic that goes. Away have, from have, neoliberal ideas. I have a question from uh, Michael Lauritsen. Just to turn well, the well, yes. The, actually, Dietz had just uh, just answered it. I think because it was uh, I, I, it it was the part about um, you know increasing welfare state um, on neoliberal terms. Uh, so that I. I didn't get it the first time, but now I do, and, and I think. Yeah, you had a comment on that. Yes. So, um, yes, yeah, uh, several things uh, I noted. So, uh, first of all, in Sweden, there are almost non no non profit uh, welfare sector. It's either uh, the municipalities or uh, private for profit companies. Um, so the move has been very very brutal in that sense when it opened up for uh, privatizations uh, it, it, it was private business um, but the ambition of the care uh, reform that i've been looking into is to allow for small small for-profit businesses basically uh, but that has not been the effect the effect has been that already existing large venture capitalist owned uh, companies have increased their market share uh, largely. Um, but I think it's also interesting what you say about uh, that it's not only price and competition uh, on the agenda anymore. And, and that is the same that I see that uh, the, the, what has happened with the pandemic is that the questions of quality uh, and and the conditions both for workers and for the elderly are now being discussed. I think uh, that uh, older older persons have a very um, weak voice in the public de debate. So uh, these issues we, they are, they are they are not new, but they are finally talked about, and that can change um, the perception of. Uh, what is most important when regulating this area. Can I ask you, you two, because we have a, a universal welfare model in, in Sweden and Scandinavia, and, and I'd like to know how that sort of works, pro and contra, the, the, the neoliberalism. And, and at the same time, we have a, a more insurance-based or continental welfare model in, in Germany and many European countries. So. Could you line up a few points about that, Dieter and Miriam? I don't know who wants to start. The expert on the universal model, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so so um, that is the point I'm trying to make about Swedish uh, neoliber li neoliberalism, that uh, it hasn't uh, switched from a universalist ambition. Uh, but what, ha what happens is that uh, when much of the delivery takes place, in the private sector uh, with for-profit companies, um, then uh, a lot of tax money goes into uh, these profits, of course, uh, and it's a high profit rate. It's a profitable sector. Uh, and of course, these profits are uh, taken on the expense of both workers and uh, users. So can um, I ask you, is, is the universal model so that you get a minimum level or is it a harmonized level of, of welfare support. 
So can you buy sort of extras when you get help? But that is also one of the things that are, is new in the system, that you can actually buy a top up. But that is a pretty new uh, part of the reform and not, not much used yet. Uh, but uh, the, it's, the uh, ambition is that the la- level should be high enough uh, mm-hmm. for everyone. It should be a high quality service. That's the universalist aim. Um, of course, uh, since it has deteriorated uh, during uh, the past two decades, there is now a, a need or a wish uh, in the middle class to be able to top up these services. And I think that also it's dr- it drives the privatization because you cannot top up if you're within the municipality. You have to choose a private mm-hmm. company to be able to buy this extra service. So that kind of steers, uh, especially the middle class and the less uh, uh, expensive uh, older, older users towards uh, choosing private companies. So, so Dieter, what what do you see? What is the development in in Germany? Well, I mean, the literature on the transformation of the welfare state, of course, there's a very important comparative literature. It's uh, pretty clear that the German system is moving uh, towards the British system. So basically, we had a much more comprehensive, conservative, patriarchal model of a welfare state, and it has been moved much more towards the Anglo-Saxon, um, sort of like more minimalist uh, and privatized. And as I mentioned before, in Germany, of course, it was a mixed uh, system from the beginning due to Erhard and the early um, neoliberal constitution of the German post-war situation, which then was social democratized only in the 1960s and 70s. Um, but um, I think the what's, what I find very interesting in terms of the uh, ever uh, strong cost argument, um, the kind of lowering of the um, of the universal dimension, you know, of course, none of these countries, none of our countries wants that people basically die in the streets. But I mean, what is then covered as a universal um, 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 supply of services in some way, one way or the other has been basically lowered. And then there is basically a growing realm of uh, for profit, private, commercial types of services you can buy, be it in dental insurance, be it in uh, general health insurance, being it, be it in elderly care. That's actually quite fascinating to see that, um, that uh, yes, modern societies cannot go back to a traditionalist model um, of the 19th century with purely private uh, care, but we see the kind of um, um, sort of like transformation of the welfare state to a, a low level universal public uh, supply and then a privatized uh, individualized insurance model mm-hmm. that um, that is very open towards the extension of uh, corporate competition and in fact we see this uh, increasing uh, activity of large companies rather than the traditional uh, firms that supply and cross-border supply. So it's mm-hmm. another another area we have where you have this uh, corporate globalization. Yeah, uh, see, Jensen, you have a question. So please uh, turn on your microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, have you analyzed the problems concerning the increase in the number of elderly in the society? So the increasing cost or expected increased cost for yeah. the last generation of, of elders requiring care. What, what yeah. kind of influence can we see from that? I mean, of course, that was the original reason for the German um, elderly care insurance scheme to be introduced in 1995, because it was no longer possible to to uh, deal with the increasing need by this the general uh, health insurance and and old age insurance. So there was an additional layer built to deal with this, and we see the kind of increasing relevance and the increasing expenses for this area, of course. And of course, in terms of an economic um, pressure on on the economic system, this is of course means an increasing cost both for the individual employee and of course indirectly also for the for the companies. So the battle over who share, who finances which part of this um, is of course playing a role. I mean, that's the dynamic that this area is uh, increasingly in the focus of um, mm-hmm. the kind of cost structure in in economics. 
So if I understand you correctly, Tita, it's sort of the failure of the private solutions to a large group of elders in society that led to the state as an actor doing something, or is that correct? Well, I mean, I mean, historically, of course, the elderly care was was entirely private um, and as much of the welfare. And then, of course, the welfare state um, steps in and increases both in terms of needs and in terms of the, the struggles for more social equality, um, the level of, um, of publicly funded uh, services. But neoliberalism then basically drives this back. And um, of course, I mean, the, the argument of the, um, the demographic change is one of the key arguments against uh, the, you know, for, for the, which to, to put pressure on the, the old age insurance, uh, the old age pension and the, uh, the elderly care, because of course the, the picture is always given, this is exploding so much, the old age, so nobody can fund this as if this is the only alternative. I mean, Germany has now recently nicely seen that um, if you have a fair amount of immigration, then you can have also a different balance of the, um, um, of the uh, demographic distribution and so on and so forth. I mean, it's not, I mean, there's no single causality because people get older, everything becomes more expensive, even though, I mean, one has to recognize demographic change is a highly relevant <laughs> dimension in society. We are in Denmark and I think in Sweden as well, we've been hearing about the growing number of elders as sort of a bump below the, the universal welfare model. Is that is that your impression? Um, it has not been as debated in Sweden, I th and I think it comes down to the decentralization of the elder care. So because the costs uh, lies on the municipalities, the, there will never be a national debate on, on these costs. Uh, instead, uh, the elder care can deteriorate without such a public debate because it takes place within municipalities. Uh, within it, It's the municipal budget that uh, uh, sets the limit. Um, so, uh, I, and I think that is also a problem because it, then it, it's hard to find to to find a national battle for better better elder care because there is no national organization around it. Yeah, but I was also going to say that uh, what you talked about, uh, uh, the insurance model, we can see that moving within the healthcare system through em employment insurances. So the healthcare has, um, the, it, it's been a large debate for five, 10 years about the, the um, the lower quality of healthcare and, and especially the, the primary healthcare sector. And, uh, and what has happened is that uh, many people go around it through uh, insurances that they get from being employed. So we now see that kind of inequality increasing in Sweden. We have uh, time for one last question, if anybody... Is up for something? Yeah, Michael? Well, uh, so I would like to ask a little bit more about the levels, which both of you have been uh, uh, touching upon. Um, uh, and s s what is, uh, if, if, if we are to see a post-corona um, diversion from the neoliberal uh, trail, what is it, which level are we going to see it on? Because I uh, recently I saw a quote from I think uh, Olaf Schulz, who recently had met Stefan Löw, and and he was talking about a renewed respect for working class and so on. And um, I I don't know. It's uh, that's not where I'm going to put my hope. I think at the state level, but um, but I would like to ask, well, where's like a, a re publicization uh, going to where, where we're going to see it at the municipal level at the linda level or uh, at the state level or uh, yeah that's my question and that's that's a good question for you to sort of uh, round up your main points because we have six minutes left and i think two and a half minutes to each of you to solve this big problem must be sufficient <laughs> so I think, yeah, do you would do you want to start 
Well, um, when it comes to healthcare, uh, the privatization search uh, came to a halt. Uh, so very little healthcare has actually moved into the private sector for the last decade, uh, or since at least since the uh, new social democratic government. So um, that is uh, what, what is happening in that sector. And I think uh, actually the conditions for the care workers is the main uh, driving force right now. Uh, just in the last weeks, there has been a large demonstration concerning uh, midwives and their conditions. And um, a lot of people, they get a lot of people behind them. And I think there that is a force to, to really reckon with. Uh, when it comes to elder care, um, there are uh, re-municipalizations uh, in that sector. And that because that is because the municipalities realize that it's too difficult to deal with all of these small uh, private actors that are uh, more or less serious and some are even criminal, etc. So uh, I think it's it, right now it's not moving towards privatizations there either. And, uh, and also there, I think uh, uh, the large uh, debate and and the, the pub growing public opinion for better um, quality and better conditions will also uh, put a hold to privatizations and uh, maybe a way to move forward. Super, thank you, Miriam. And Dieter, you'll have your two and a half minutes to round up. Yeah, I, I would also see, I mean, in, in the slide I had up um, of the three scenarios, the kind of return to neoliberal status quo ante crisis or selective departure from neoliberalism or uh, transformative change, uh, I, I definitely see space for at least selective departures in terms of um, the, the COVID crisis because the, the limits of the previous uh, commercialization drive and the, the, the lack of capacity to be prepared for such moments of crisis and uh, the circumstances, um, plus the lack of uh, staffing levels, um, lack of capacity, physical infrastructures and lack of staffing levels to provide proper care. Um, has been sort of like sent in, in the center now of the debate rather than the kind of argument, oh, there's, you know, we have more beds than Italy or more beds than the Netherlands. And so even the, the richer countries have uh, suffered tremendously from the lack of capacity. And of course, the COVID uh, circumstances have uh, put the, the plight of the workforces and their uh, key contribution to to this uh, so much at the center that um, the trade unions and the workers have been very strongly um, using this to actually start uh, what we call here now the hospital movement, which is really a struggle for higher wages, better staffing levels. So it's both quality and uh, re re uh, and pay uh, structures, which is interesting because, of course, these are the things we need to see that we need uh, that we build up new social basis for the social sort of like agency that can move us uh, beyond neoliberalism. We have seen the decline of trade unions, the decline of the the kind of um, capacities that would move us towards greater solidarity and equality. And if we don't see this purely from politics, uh, we cannot expect this. So we need to see this emerging in terms of the social agents that uh, then build and drive and further develop these movements and then move from the hospital movement towards uh, you know, a broader uh, movement. But that's exactly where we need this compass, you know, need to watch and, and uh, mutually observe what, what happens in the different areas and countries and maybe see this as a basis uh, to move from selective to a more comprehensive departure from uh, the neoliberal concerns. I wanted to ask you one last question that can be answered with a yes or no. And that is, uh, Winston Churchill said, never waste a good crisis. And I want to ask you, is there a good crisis now? And is the, the, the parties of the left, are, are they wasting it? So I don't know, Miriam, can you give us a very brief comment on that? Um, uh, a year ago, I would answer, yes, now is the time to move. Now it kind of has all, all, already passed and we are moving into a post-corona situation where other things are 
uh, on the agenda. Uh, in Sweden, uh, crime is now the most important uh, question on, on the public agenda. And yeah, and I think we, we were too slow. We, we could have moved much more uh, when the crisis was on. That and, I think. And Dieter? Well, I mean, in Germany, you know, the results of the last elections, um, the, the, it's been not the case that the left party has benefited from the sort of like uh, crisis related movements. Uh, there seems to be uh, at this point a bit of a disconnect between uh, progressive movement uh, positive developments and then the kind of difficulties we see in the uh, parliamentarian mm -hmm. realm. And if that is not closed, that gap, then um, in terms of the political field, um, uh, it will be a, a wasted, <laughs> wasted crisis. Those so are the we, last yeah, words can. from our experts today. And uh, I'll encourage you to turn on your sound, everybody, and give the famous uh, Zoom clap that nobody really can hear, but it's there. It's there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, D to Plevi, for your contributions. And thanks a lot to you, Mia and Katzin, for being here today and contributing to the debate. Um, we'll round out the meeting for now, but we have one final meeting coming up. And Slatko, I don't know if you can disclose here anything about it yet, or? Yes, I can only say that it will be on the digital uh, digitalization and uh, the, the, the issue of, of possible regulations and what should be the, the life uh, perspective on that. And, and we'll be sure to announce it on our website and the RS will do the same. So thank you for being here today, all of you, and, uh, and hopefully see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.